Hi BSD CAN, this is Thomas Munro and um, I'm going to be talking about some news, observations and speculation from the world of Postgres on FreeBSD. A bit about myself, I'm a Postgres major contributor and committer and I'm employed by Microsoft to work on Postgres. I'm also a minor contributor to FreeBSD and a committer, and I do a lot of my Postgres work on FreeBSD systems, and that leads me to find small things that can be improved here and there on, on, on both projects. And so I wanted to, to, to give a talk about that. It's a real shame that we couldn't all meet in Canada this year. I was really looking forward to my first BSD CAN and meeting a whole bunch of BSD people, uh, including my, uh, my mentor and many others. Um, but all the same, uh, thanks very much to Dan for organizing this video edition of um, Stay at Home BSD CAN, and I'm really looking forward to watching all the talks. I'm going to start with a, a, a brief show and tell of some recent changes on the both the Postgres and the FreeBSD side that have improved the user experience or performance, and then we'll, after that, move on to some future ideas. The first thing I wanted to talk about is KQ, which uh, we added to Postgres 13, which has just gone into feature freeze and should be available in the next few months. The change matches what we did for Linux um, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, um, where we switched to ePoll. And it solves a problem where on certain uh, usage patterns where you have very large numbers of connections coming into a system, typically with multiple sockets. This, uh, there's some graphs there you can see that were sent to me by Rui D'Souza. He was running a, a dual socket system. I think these graphs were from his production system. He took the KQ patch in an earlier form and applied it to his Postgres 11. Um, I think that's from his production system. He applied that and he was brave enough to run that um, from the, the an earlier patch I'd shared. And you can see that there's a huge amount of system time um, in the top graph. You can see that red, um, and you can see there's a very large system load, and that's because there was a lot of contention um, within the kernel doing uh, polling, mostly to do with a, a, a pipe that connects the postmaster process to every child process in Postgres. And that pipe is used for emergency fast shutdown of the, the whole cluster of processes, uh, which was um, something that, it doesn't the contention doesn't really show up on small systems so i'm not expecting this patch to make much difference to most users um, but certain users with very large systems um, should see an improvement in this area from using kq that said there are some usage patterns on smaller systems where this will improve performance and it's also expected to uh, be very useful for future stuff that we're doing that involves connecting to many other Postgres servers and combining their results in a query for a, shard, a query sharding type system. Uh, and it may also prove to be useful for the asynchronous IO stuff that I'm gonna be talking about um, in a few slides. Using KQ and ePoll helped us um, sort out contention problems on that pipe that goes between the postmaster parent process and all the regular Postgres worker processes um, at times when we were waiting. But sometimes we also want, sometimes we've got a CPU bound loop, which is doing um, work like crash recovery or streaming replication. And we want those loops to be able to exit as quickly as possible when the parent process goes away for an emergency shutdown as well. And so, uh, to fix that problem, in the past we used to regularly read from the pipe, um, which is non-blocking, so we would you know, try and check if the pipe had gone away, and that was producing a high rate of system calls, and of course system calls aren't getting any cheaper, so uh, we were looking around for a way to improve that situation, and we came across pdeathsig on Linux, which lets you ask for a signal to be delivered to your process if your parent process goes away. That came originally from IRIX, which... Um, had a slightly different interface, but um, that's the oldest system I found that has a way to ask for a signal when your parent goes away. And so I wrote a very small patch for FreeBSD to add the same facility uh, uh, using naming similar to the Linux facility. So people writing portable software will recognize it, which is proc pdeath signal control. Um, that's simply 
stick something in your proc struct to say, hey, if you're if you're exiting and reparenting me, then please send me a signal. And that um, works pretty well, and we're able to remove a whole bunch of senseless, uh, annoying system calls from these busy loops in in replication code in the in the main replication loop of Postgres, and that's responsible for for a measurable speed up. A small and superficial change that I really enjoyed making um, was figuring out why set proc title was so slow on FreeBSD compared to all the other Unix systems that I regularly use and test things on. And that was caused by the fact that FreeBSD would make two system calls every time you called set proc title, but all these other systems would just override a piece of process memory. And then programs like PS and TOP would do the extra work Going, asking the kernel to go and fish that out of each process's memory. And I discovered, to my amazement, that FreeBSD actually still had code paths to support that because that's how, the way the other BSDs do it. And it, 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 the code paths were still there from ancient BSD times, I suppose. And so I just revived that code path and, and made it um, ex expose it as set proc title fast. And Postgres calls that really often because it likes to tell users what it's doing. So you're looking at top, and you can see, uh, you know, you can see that this, there's an example there. You can see there's a streaming replication thing. There's um, showing you its progress, and there's um, individual backends showing you what what kind of command they're currently executing. Um, the, the port for Postgres on FreeBSD turns that off by default because historically it was so expensive. Um, hopefully in future people will not feel the need to turn that off and they'll get the same exper user experience they get on other Unix systems. The next show and tell item is not specifically about FreeBSD, but it's about Postgres on ZFS, which I think is common enough on FreeBSD uh, that I include it. So the joint people who ran a pretty large fleet of Illumos uh, ZFS-based Postgres database servers uh, reported that Postgres was slower um, than it could be at recycling the wall files. That the, that's the write-ahead log that it writes to very busily when you've when you've got a you know a very busy database that's making a lot of changes. Um, and what it would do is it would rename older files into place to make them. It, it has these 16 megabyte files and it sort of would rotate them by renaming them. And um, and only if it couldn't do that, it would zero fill a new file to create a new 16 megabyte file for reasons I'll discuss in a moment. And um, they worked out that on ZFS, that was a complete waste of time and was actually more expensive than doing nothing at all and just creating a new file. So they provided us with patches to do that. And actually, most people couldn't reproduce any gain from, from, from using that, especially, especially if they had very fast storage. I found that in my own home lab on FreeBSD using spinning disks, I was able to to, to show a speed up from um, these new settings, wall init zero, which you can turn off, which says, hey, instead of filling a 16 megabyte file up with zeros, that will have to be you know, on a copy and write file system. It doesn't make any sense to you know reserve the space or anything like that. So, And then there's the um, recycling. Well, if you just make new files, it turns out that that's faster than um, renaming an old file whose D node has fallen out of memory or something like that. I'm not quite sure of the exact mechanism, but uh, so yeah, that's a couple of settings that went in. If you're running Postgres on ZFS, um, especially on slower media, you, you might want to experiment with those settings. Um, yeah. One very nice performance improvement that we got a couple of years back um, in FreeBSD 11.1, the F data sync system call was added by Kib and that gives us, on a very simple test on my laptop, I can see a 10% performance improvement in a single threaded PG bench, just because um, it means that the system, you don't have to wait for modified times to be flushed to disk every time, file modified times and access times and so, things like that, that are not essential for data integrity um, to be flushed, which basically saves on a bunch of IOs. Um, and so that's a, a very nice improvement. But for FreeBSD 13, I'd like to get a couple of close cousins of that feature in. One of them is the ability to open a file with the odsync flag from POSIX, which says essentially that every write has an implicit fdatasync in it. Um, and so that can, that can save a further system call. And um, then there is the asynchronous cousin 
AIO F-Sync that already exists in, in FreeBSD and has for a very long time, but it also needs OD-Sync support so that it can um, f avoid having to write back unnecessary metadata. Um, and I'm going to be talking about um, AIO in, in, in a couple of slides from now uh, as a future direction for Postgres um, IO. And I've got, I've got the um, review ticket numbers there if anyone's interested in looking at that work. Maybe by the time I've, it's, maybe by the time this is shown, it, it will be committed, I'm not sure. Running very quickly through some IPC changes in the last few or two or three years. Postgres 12 allows you to ask for shared memory, the main shared memory region, to be in System 5 shared memory. That's what we used to do years and years ago, um, but it's nice to have the option back if you want to uh, do that instead of anonymous inherited shared memory. Because for a start, there's some evidence that it might still be give you slightly better performance if you use the uh, shared memory use fizz setting to avoid a whole bunch of uh, page accounting overheads. That's also useful for some other operating systems like AIX, which um, can't get, can only get super pages for shared memory of that type. Um, so yeah, a couple of different motivations for adding that feature back in. Um, another thing is that uh, FreeBSD 11 gained the ability to uh, isolate System 5 shared memory correctly between jails in the past, you used to have to make sure you're using different ports for um, different uh, Postgres installations in different jails, because otherwise their shared memory would see each other and, and get confused, and that was a problem. So uh, thanks very much to Jamie at freebc.org for uh, fixing that up a few years ago now. Another um, thing in the IPC category is that in Postgres 10, a couple of years ago, we switched to unnamed semaphores instead of instead of uh, POSIX unnamed semaphores instead of the System 5 kind. Um, the main reason was probably because you had to um, use System CTL to go and you know adjust settings before Postgres could run with an interesting number of semaphores, um, which now you don't have to worry about. Um, it's also it also gives better performance because we can uh, cache line pad the uh, semaphores that we create in our own array, which is pretty neat. I was reminded to put this on this slide because I was recently reading the FreeBSD design and implementation book, which says that Postgres uses system five semaphores, which was true at the time the book was written, second edition. Um, but since then we've, we've changed that. Going back a few years to FreeBSD 11, there was one change that I was really happy about. That was the um, Unicode collation support that was brought in from Illumos and Dragonfly BSD code. Um, thanks to BAPT for doing that. Previously, if you used the string collation, so that's deciding the order of two strings according to national norms, you know, locales, um, it, it didn't work correctly for UTF-8 uh, encoded text. Um, it's a really, so string collation is something that databases do a lot of. Um, Sorting is one of our principal weapons, and um, this change enabled uh, Postgres on FreeBSD using the libc collation support to um, do what users expect and sort things in the way that makes sense for um, each uh, country or whatever and language. So um, people might think, well, so Postgres can also use libicu to order text. But um, I personally think it's important to be able to use libc as an option to agree with other software running on the same system. Um, so this, of course, is going back to, to 2014. So this is pretty old news by now. It doesn't really belong in a news section. But I did want a chance to highlight this in front of the, this kind of BSD, pan BSD group, uh, just to get a chance to say that I think it would be really cool if other BSDs um, and maybe even Mac OS, if anybody is listening, um, were to adopt this code because um, on some of those systems, you, you still can't get um, uh, the sorting behavior that users expect from um, uh, UTF-8 text, which is pretty much most users these days. Uh, and that's a problem. Uh, so now I'm gonna talk about some ideas and work in progress uh, relating to IO in FreeBSD. The first thing is POSIX FAdvise, which has 
um, which is a system call that takes a variety of different hints where you can tell the kernel um, to about your future intentions with a file descriptor and it can try to uh, do useful things with buffered data. So one of the hints is POSIX fadvise will need. Will need says, hey, I'm going to call pread soon. So Postgres makes use of this um, to generate some overlapping reads. And there's a setting, effective IO concurrency. And in particular, if you do a bitmap heap scan, which is a pretty useful kind of scan where we can combine several indexes, like say you've got several indexes on a table and you've got a query that has some ands and some, or maybe some ors or whatever combination, it can build a bitmap of all potentially matching pages uh, heap pages or like table pages from each index and then it can add them and all them in various different ways and then so you finish up having this bitmap of pages that you know you're going to be reading so um, it's a good opportunity to read ahead tell the kernel hey I'm going to read this thing soon um, I suppose you could have a background process that does the same thing at the moment we use POSIX F advice to do that um, as a kind of poor man's asynchronous IO um, I'll talk about real asynchronous IO in a minute um, so Postgres does that uh, and it works really well for some um, some users. But actually, I did a bit of a survey. I looked around at a whole bunch of different operating systems, and I found that it actually only works on Linux and NetBSD, to my knowledge. So um, some operating systems just don't have the system call at all. No POSIX have advised. That's Mac OS, OpenBSD, Windows. Some of them have a stub function. So um, I suppose they conform to POSIX or whatever, but it doesn't actually do anything at all. It's just a libc function that literally does nothing. That's Solaris and Lumos. Um, and then there are some that have POSIX F advise and have a real system call, and they can handle some kinds of hints, but they ignore will need, and that includes FreeBSD and AIX. Um, I don't know what H HBOX is anyone I uh, couldn't get my hands on to sort of try and figure it out. Um, it does have a system call. I don't know if it does anything with it. So could we implement will need for FreeBSD? Well, I had a bit of a look at this and I found um, if you look at UFS, NFS and ZFS, for UFS, it looks like it's pretty easy. And I made this work uh, well enough for Postgres to be able to get some big bitmap um, heap scans to run faster. Um, I added an FFS advise. I had it simply called B read A, B -read -A which is the existing um, read ahead support code that um, it, that um, does some kinds of prefetching when you do sequential access. Um, it's I'm not the, my, my code is like just proof of concept code. I'm not proposing it to anyone, but it, it kind of works and it, just a few lines. Uh, the point being, the code that knows how to do that kind of stuff is already there. You just have to wire it up, right? Um, and so the next thing I looked at was NFS, um, pretty much the same situation. There's code already there to do read ahead. If you've if you've configured your NFS um, so that it your NFS client so that it um, has some number of worker um, kernel threads or processes, whatever they're called, daemons, um, then uh, the code's already there. I, if you just refactor it slightly and you know. Um, Define an NFS advise and hook that up to the to the vops and 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 you know you can get it to to, to prefetch when the user calls is, user calls passes in will need hints um, and then perhaps the most interesting but maybe hardest to get done is ZFS um, so and um, personally I run some databases on FreeBSD on ZFS and so that's the one I'm ultimately most interested in the other ones are uh, still interesting to me. Um, it would, and, and I, you know, I'd like to look into those a bit more. Um, so ZFS has really good prefetching um, of its own. Uh, D DMU prefetch is basically a function that maps directly to will need. Um, it does this like literally. It's called in various places in the ZFS code to to do, to do read ahead. It's literally just a matter of exposing that through the will need interface. Um, perhaps putting some limits on how what you can do with it or whatever. Um, so in order to get that done. Um, uh, first of all, I wrote a patch for the ZFS that's in the in the FreeBSD tree, and that that worked pretty well. Um, but um, through Twitter conversations, I realized that to really go, go anywhere with that, I'd need to propose it to open ZFS. So, and the, and one of the steps in doing that is to make it work on Linux ZFS as well. So, I actually uh, tried to write a Linux uh, ZFS patch, which turned out to be very small. Um, but actually getting it, I did that, actually, that was last Christmas, and um, I've been super tied up with other kinds of stuff, um, a new job and various um, things. Uh, 
coronavirus lockdown and all sorts and i just haven't quite got back to uh to finishing that but the there's a bunch of details like making it work with linux memory mapped files and the main thing is sort of figuring out how to write decent automated tests to meet urban zfs's kind of requirements for patch submissions so um yeah it basically works but more more, more work needed to to get that working and I've got a link there to the pull request I made back around Christmas time, uh, which shows the basic patch. And uh, that's the Linux version, actually. The FreeBSD version is extremely similar, and they're both very simple. It's literally just, here's the system call, and here's the uh, VFS you know, entry point, and here's how you hook it up to DMU prefetch. Okay. Another interesting system call that uh, works on, exists only on Linux, and, and um, many people say it's very useful. I haven't, I'm not quite as sure about this one as I am about the will need stuff. Um, so Redis, MongoDB, Hadoop, Postgres, and probably other people make use of this Linux interface sync file range, which is a bit like F-Sync, but it lets you uh, say, I don't want to wait. It just initiates a write back, or, or you can have a waiting one, and it's got various other um, more subtle options, and it can work with a range of a file rather than the whole file. Um, so this can be used to con for user-based programs to control the write-back rate, especially in our case, if we know we're going to be calling F-Sync as part of a checkpoint in the future, and we want to smooth out the write-back rather than you know, every half an hour doing this massive write-back or whatever. And <clears throat> one reason for wanting to do this is that we have different kinds of files. We know that some of them we're going to be F-Syncing and some of them we're not. And the ones that we're not, we'd actually rather, if the kernel can avoid it, if it doesn't have too much memory pressure, if we can avoid writing back some stuff that we don't really want to touch the disk because we're going to be deleting it shortly, like some temporary data used while sorting or something like that. So that's another reason to to, to want to use that. So um, I've wondered for a while how this should look. I mean, you could just make a sync file range system call that behaves the same way, and someone has proposed that. It was actually a colleague of mine, and it was Freund raised this uh, Bugzilla ticket uh, for FreeBSD's Bugzilla 203891, asking, you know, why we don't have that. And so um, I've wondered for a while how, like, what would POSIX call that? And it's sort of a bit like POSIX F advised don't need, except that that contains the idea that. Not only things should be written back, but they should be dropped out of kernel buffers, which isn't necessarily what we want uh, to do here. We just want to force a write back or request write the write back begin. Uh, another thing that uh, I mean, I suppose you could think of it as a wheel sync hint. You were basically saying, "Hey, I'm going to sync this thing soon. If you could get started on that, then when I call fsync, it won't take it, it won't block for as long, or maybe at all." That would, so perhaps that's a name it could have. Now I don't actually know if this concept even makes sense for, for ZFS. I, I I'm not um, sure enough about ZFS really works to have an opinion on that. I think it probably does make sense for UFS and NFS for the same reason that it makes sense for, for example, XFS on uh, Linux. Um, so uh, that's an interesting area to look into. One problem that all relational databases have to deal with is torn pages. That is, you might lose power while the system was writing um, a data page and you might finish up with a page that contains half the old contents and half the new contents or something worse. So Postgres defends itself against that by dumping a full copy of every page that it touches the first time it's touched, modified that is, after a checkpoint. So whenever there's a checkpoint, after, after a checkpoint, there's then a flurry of extra wall logging as every eight kilobyte page that gets touched gets dumped into the log and that generates a ton of extra traffic. That's one approach to the problem. There's another approach to the problem used by MySQL, which is that it double writes every single page. So every time you, um, rather than writing extra images into the wall, it writes two copies of every data page um, with a sync in between because uh, that acts as a barrier. Only the, bef only the first or the second one can, can, can be torn. They can't both be torn. And that way you can always get to the old version or the new version without confusion. Um, presumably you've got checksums and so on to let you know which is which. You can turn that kind of stuff off um, if you know what the if you know that the power loss atomicity of the storage subsystem is a multiple of the database's page size. So um, for example, that's true if you're using ZFS and the record size is eight kilobytes or larger. If it's not true, if you're using some overwrite file system on a disk that has 
four kilobyte sectors, atomic sectors, or 512 byte sectors, the traditional size. Um, so, but what would be really nice would be if you could ask the operating system for this information. Um, you know, and maybe full page writes equals on or off would still be a setting that the 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 DBA has to choose when they're setting up their database. But if it could ask the operating system if it if it and and warn you that you've you've got it off when you need it on or you've got it on when you don't need it, that that would be uh, quite a useful thing. I'm not quite sure what technical problems are involved in making that work. So. Uh, when I was talking about fadvise and sync file range and that kind of stuff, um, maybe you were thinking, why are you doing all this stuff um, when you could just completely take it? Like, those problems all, all relate to buffering and taking greater control of the, the buffering and, and um, I.O. scheduling. And um, the we'll need thing is actually, I even called it a poor man's asynchronous I.O., why don't we just do proper asynchronous I/O and optionally direct I/O, and that's that's what we're currently starting to think about doing. I think in a few years from now we probably will um, use those much more modern interfaces. So one problem is that um, th there isn't just one um, uh, API you can use for decent asynchronous I/O across all operating systems, and Postgres cares a lot about portability, um, so that's something we we want to think about a bit. Um, POSIX AIO is obviously what FreeBSD uses, um, and it's um, unfortunately not really that widely supported. So, for example, um, all of the well, some of the um, commercial Unixes um, have really good support. Um, some of them, Solaris, I think it just has emulation in in Libc with user userland threads doing all the work. Um, Linux has a couple of different ways of doing it. One is glibc can do use land threads and, and emulation. We don't want that because Postgres actually isn't really that compatible with um, the thread model. Like, eventually we'll probably use threads probably properly in Postgres, but at the moment we have this process model. We certainly don't want glibc creating a thread pool in every process and then doing a whole bunch of AIO, AIO simulation, if you, if you want to call it that. Um, but none of, and then Linux has another incompatible non-POSIX interface, um, which so which doesn't support buffered I/O, so that's no good for us either. Uh, and then Windows does it a completely different way, completely different way again. So, um, but at the moment, the sort of the new hotness in in the Linux world is I/O U-ring, which can, which lets you submit I/O requests and get um, completion notifications um, without making system calls, um, unless you have to sleep, you know then. You might want to make system calls then, of course, but um, so a, a well-tuned system could avoid a whole bunch of system call uh, context switching and and so forth. Um, so that's like the nth asynchronous I/O interface for Linux and 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 not standard or anything like that. Uh, but it's I think it's going to be a pretty big thing, and we're we're probably and um, my a colleague of mine, Andres Freund, is working on an I/O ring based asynchronous. Um, and direct I/O implementation for Postgres on on Linux. Um, I'd like to add support for the similar stuff based on POSIX I/O, which would automatically work across the B the BSDs that support that, as well as um, the commercial Unixes as well. Um, <clears throat> and then we'll probably do a Windows uh, version as well. So um, that's just a you know, I just wanted to say that's kind of where we're we're headed next. Um, so all of this stuff about um, POSIX F advice and so on is, I don't know. I think it's I think it's quite useful to to do that work as well. I think it's um probably would benefit other software as well. It's part of the POSIX interface. We might as well have working implementations of that stuff. Um, there is one open question at the moment. I've been looking into this a little bit. How if we use POSIX POSIX AIO on on FreeBSD, should we use KQ for the completion notifications? As far as I can tell. Even though some other other operating systems have AIO and KQ, for example, macOS, it doesn't use them both. It it can't use KQ for delivery of um, completion events. So uh, you know we'd certainly have to write, and and obviously things like AIX and so on don't have it at all. So we'd have to write um, signal based notification support anyway. And it might be that there's no reason to have two ways of doing it. So uh, I'll 
that's something I'll be looking to, looking into in the future as I try and um, uh, take what Andres, is, Andres has been doing to get this um, async IO working and, and try and make it work on FreeBSD as well. In this section, I'm going to talk about three interesting differences I ran into between FreeBSD and Linux. One thing that people sometimes complain about when they try Postgres on FreeBSD with UFS is that some parallel queries, which basically queries where we use multiple processes to execute the query, typically because there's a very large scan of a very large amount of data involved, um, they spread reads of sequential blocks out over multiple processes. And the way they do that to the operating system doesn't look like sequential reading um, on FreeBSD. So you can see in that um, example there on the slide that um, it, you know, it took twice as long to process this particular very simple count query um, when I told it it could use parallel processes, but it, as when I told it it couldn't. And that's because the sequential access heuristic was defeated by this bizarre trick. And so I guess, um, you know, and I know how to fix this both on the FreeBSD side and on the Postgres side. And I think po it's quite possible that that access pattern is just really terrible and Postgres just shouldn't do that. So that's why I'm not actually proposing a change for FreeBSD to handle that thing. But how do we finish up writing code that behaves like that? Um, well, the answer is that on um, some very popular file systems and operating systems, it actually just works fine. And that's because they have this window to recognize sequential access. They don't require, on Linux, for example, you don't have to access strictly the next block for it to be counted to sequential access. Um, it's got this window size, and so that actually works fine on Linux. Um, another thing is that on ZFS, it seems to work fine too. I don't know exactly the mechanism there, but it doesn't seem to be, it doesn't seem to have this problem. So um, yeah, that's that's why I'm putting this just in the observations section. We'll probably go and do something a bit smarter on the Postgres side than uh, these weird interleaved small reads. Um, and a related topic is that, you know, in the in the, related in the sense that it's about sequential access heuristics is that on FreeBSD, when you mix reads and writes at two positions in one file, so that's essentially two sequential streams, um, it won't, it'll think that that's random. It'll think you're zigzagging back and forth between these two different streams. Um, and some, many other operating systems don't do that. They, they, they can happily detect sequential access in two streams. And Postgres happens to actually do that quite often. Um, uh, read and write at the same time, some small distance apart due to a buffering scheme, as does SQLite and a number of other systems. So um, for that particular uh, problem, I think it is something that should be fixed um, in FreeBSD. And I um, proposed a, a change from uh, Andrew Geerth, who he wrote a patch quite some time ago. He's a colleague of mine in the Postgres community, and he, um, you know, we're, we're going to try and get that, that fixed. Now you might ask, well, why don't you detect more than two streams, or why do they have to? Why does it have to be a read and a write? And that's a very good question. Um, I I don't have a design for a general a magic stream finder, um, although I believe there might be something like that inside ZFS. Um, yeah, it's pretty well known in the Postgres and Oracle and other database communities that um, using super or huge pages is really beneficial for database performance. And in fact, when I um, was working on parallel hash joins for Postgres, I I was quite surprised to see that on the same hardware, FreeBSD out of the box would do much, much better than Linux at these very large hash table probes. And the reason was because of um, using super pages, which FreeBSD does a pretty good job of doing automatically. It's um, quite transparent. Um, you can't even really turn it off. I, I suppose Linux and Windows and other operating systems will eventually do a better job of um, doing that sort of thing transparently. But at the moment, you have to jump through some um, strange hoops to get your text segment into huge pages on Linux. Um, and likewise for um, POSIX shared memory that we use for large parallel queries. And um, the details vary for different the different categories of memory. So that's just something that works very nicely out of the box on FreeBSD. Now, I ran into this paper recently um, published by Alan Cox and some others about specifically the text segment part of the problem. And um, the, the paper, I don't claim to understand all of it, but uh, 
it happens to use Postgres as one of the test applications and talks about a number of further improvements that could be made to uh, get um, better usage of super pages for the text segment. So that's uh, quite an interesting paper to go and have a look at if you're interested in this subject. FreeBSD and Linux, and for that matter, I think most other operating systems, take a, a different approach to write back errors of buffered data. FreeBSD keeps the data around and keeps it dirty. So that if you call fsync twice in a row, and if you call fsync and it returns a, a, an, an error, um, and then you try it again, uh, you'll either still get an error or you'll get a success indicating that it really did succeed this time. Um, whereas Linux will report the error once, but after that, there's no guarantee that it has the data in its uh, buffer cache anymore. So you could call fsync a second time and it could report success despite not having written back your data. Um, it's not really clear to me from uh, anything written in POSIX whether that's, um, uh, you know, positively correct or, or, or anything like that. And I'm not really interested in getting into that argument anyway. But um, it's certainly a problem for applications such as Postgres, MySQL, MongoDB, and probably many others that believed that it was okay to, to try fsync again. Um, so we, we, when we worked that out, we had to change um, Postgres to... To, to panic if there was any kind of fsync failure, because after that we don't really know what the state of the buffer cache is. Um, and you might be wondering how on earth, you know, are errors from fsync actually transient anyway? I mean, if it tells you that your disk is fried, then is your disk going to come back from being fried? Well, probably not. But there are some cases where this kind of thing comes up. Um, for example, if you're using NFS, um, NFS reports can can report e no space when you call fsync. Um, and obviously being out of space on some remote server is something that can change. So, you know, it, the concept of, of, of retrying is not completely insane. Um, but yeah, we, 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 we don't do that anymore because <laughs> now we know that it doesn't actually do what we thought it did. I think that's a pretty interesting difference in philosophy between FreeBSD and Linux. And is the, the FreeBSD way of doing it is what I had always assumed it sort of fits my mental model for how that sort of thing should work. I mean, the dirty the, the, the dirty data is still dirty if it wasn't written back, right? Uh, there is actually there are actually a whole lot more really murky details in this area, which I'm not going to go into in this uh, talk. But um, there's a link at the end where you can find some more information about this, um, looking into many different operating systems and um, the meaning of all this stuff. Uh, generally, you know, this is yet another reason to think that we should probably in Postgres just be doing direct IO and completely owning the problem of buffering and scheduling and error handling and all that kind of stuff. There's a few other things that I um, didn't really have time to fit into the talk in any detail, but I just wanted to dump into a, a parting wish list. Um, there's a bunch of improvements that I think we could potentially make to the text comparison system, uh, which I've listed there. Um, and uh, on the, uh, I've got some links at the end to some more information about that. Um, there's also a few improvements that I think we could make to the port uh, um, that would give people an experience more on par with what they get from, say, the Debian packaging, which I think is probably the best packaging out there of Postgres. It's got a very nice way to run multiple instances of Postgres and start them, stop them, copy them, create them, etc., and supports multiple major versions of Postgres at the same time, which is something that's quite important to most users. And it would be nice to be able to do that without having to set up jails. Thanks very much for tuning into my talk. I hope you found some of this stuff interesting. I've included a few links here uh, on the final slide to some things that to some more information and some things that were mentioned along the way. Um, yeah, feel free to drop me an email if you want to talk about any of these topics um, and I'll see you around. Thanks, bye.